discuss um, a recently um, published study on um, actually in summary on how to um, yeah on radiologically isolated syndrome. So that means so that is actually a manifestation of um, that is a manifest a disease manifestation that is entirely limited to the brain. So these people they have MS lesions in the brain, but they don't have any symptoms. And this of obviously um, it's very intriguing because. A lot of these people have a lot of lesions, but they never ever reported anything clinically. So this is really difficult in clinical practice because you feel as a neurologist, you feel the need that you have to do something because all these lesions are there in the brain. But yeah, as patients did not have any symptoms, it's very difficult um, to act on it. So this study has been uh, monitoring uh, people with a radiologically isolated sim uh, symptom um, for um, 10 years prospectively to see how many of these people that when they um, when they manifest or when they come to the clinician with an MRI showing MS lesions, how many of these people that actually in the future after this um, this um, observation will go on to report clinical symptoms. So it's a very ambitious study, and it also shows that um, that this radiologically isolated symptom is somewhere on the spectrum of clinical MS. That is very clear from it. So, so Igor, uh, one, one of the things, one of the points you made, it's quite an important one. You said it's always in the brain. I think you can have risk of the spinal cord. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. It's the central nervous system. So, um, yes, but I think it's to fulfill the criteria for radiologically isolated symptom. Uh, syndrome, you obviously need lesions um, infratorial, but also supratorial. Supra yeah, you uh, need to be. Yeah, yes. you need dissemination in a space. So, yes, so yeah. you need like like regular people with MS. You need dissemination in space, so it cannot be only spinal cord. It must be both brain and spinal, brain and spinal cord, or um, brain on itself, but not only spinal cord. But then there is another very important point that Ida just mentioned, and it's about uh, uh, these patients having no, having no symptoms in the past. You know, like uh, there's this yeah. study uh, yeah. where they actually realized that up to 30% of patients yeah. who, uh, with, with a first clinical attack had, has, ha have had um, uh, clinical episodes suggestive of a demyelinating event in the past. So you have to make sure this patient uh, has not had any clinical event in the past, and you have to, uh, it's very important to even ask about prodromal MS symptoms, including headaches, including cognitive dysfunction, fatigue. Um, so you have to make sure you are not dealing with a situation where the patient has uh, an incomplete uh, clinical history rather than, than a, a, a real uh, case of uh, risk. Yeah, so I think those kind of cases would probably fulfill the definition of prodromal MS now when they have symptoms yeah. or symptoms that aren't enough to diagnose a CIS, for example. We'd call that prodromal MS probably. Yep, probably. Okay. So, so, so these cases are all risk without any symptoms. Yeah, so the, so that's also one of the, what they in the discussion name as one of the strengths of the study that they did a meticulous medical history and that they um, specifically screened for all the, um, so I think they have um, outlined it. Oh no, this is the, yes. So they have outlined it here in their methods um, that they had a very extensive and comprehensive questionnaire that kind of um, was aimed at detecting all these more insidious uh, symptoms yeah. um, of multiple sclerosis. And indeed, uh, so they have um, uh, one study has um, did the same exercise. So they looked at people that were referred to a to a tertiary, a tertiary center um, for radiologically isolated syndrome, and apparently only one third of these people in the end ended up with a definite diagnosis of risk and the majority of, of the remaining people, because it's not only about MS, it's mainly about the differential with vascular um, abnormalities that is difficult because some people are labeled as risk, but they just have hypertension or other um, comorbidities um, that are falsely labeled as risk in the context of demyelination. 
So this is one of the strengths of the studies that I did such a thorough work on, um, on the uh, inclusion. So both clinically and also radiologically, because both, all the MRIs were reviewed by at least two radiologists, which is, um, to, and they, that looked for consensus. And they did a very, very uh, thorough clinical um, medical history, which was, um, much more than <laughs> we probably do actually in clinic. <laughs> so um, very good study design. Yeah. So and then so um, obviously this radiological isolated syndrome is not su it's not super common. So to reach this um, study population of 451 uh, people people with risk, huh? so they had to um, had to include people from 21 clinical sites in five countries uh, already. Uh, I think it already represents the difficulty of recruiting qualitative cases. Um, and so then, um, so they followed up these people hmm, um, for now 10 years uh, in total. And then, uh, so this is an extension on their previous article that only, for, um, only uh, reported on a follow-up of five years. And now I think the big finding of the study is that approximately 50% um, of the people after 10 years um, that they um, manifest, with a, that they clinically manifest as having or primary progressive MS or um, relapsing remitting MS. So that means that half of the people that initially um, were diagnosed with risk in 10 years from um, this conclusion or from this diagnosis, that they will have a clinical um, manifestation. So that actually the 10 years that, so if this is, uh, yeah, that, yeah, that half of these people uh, ha were progressing while actually we were all watching. That's actually the difficulty uh, or the difficult, um, the, the problem that this study raises. Yeah. Um, so, so what about uh, risk uh, factors? Yeah, so that's um, one of the interesting studies. So obviously, because it is a prospective study design, they were also uh, been able to, rep so they reported a lot of demographical variables at index, um, so at the initiation of the study. Um, and so then they looked uh, whether um, these demographical variables, such as age, gender, um, for example, treatment, uh, that they influenced the risk of a clinical manifestation later on. So, and then this is uh, summarized in this table. So they did statistical tests to look which of these demographical variables were predictive. And then, so when they looked at each of these variables individually, then especially age um, was, a, was predictive. So it means that mm, the younger you manifest with a radiologically isolated syndrome, the likelier or the more uh, likely it becomes that you once in, in, in the future will have clinical symptoms. Um, do, you, do you think that's because um, people who are younger are more likely to have real MS compared to mimics? Maybe. I think yes. I think it's. Uh, I think it's a dual. So I think there's just you. I think definitely because you're younger, a lot of I mean, you, normally you don't have hypertension or other um, causes that um, could also. Um, induce these T2 hyperintense lesions, but I also think that it's just a matter of, just a matter of, um, yeah, time. So I think you have so much more time to manifest with a clinical disease. <laughs> so I, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, the other thing is we do know that age is age is inversely correlated with activity. So yeah, yeah that's true. The, the younger you are, the more likely to have more relapses. And as you get older, relapses get less frequent. Yes, but you could also, obviously, also a lot of these people evolve into progressive MS. So, yeah, I think it's it's probably the biggest factor is probably the fact that they don't have other comorbidities that could also explain um, the T2 hyperintense lesions. But I also think it's it's partially partially because they have more time to manifest with disease. Yeah, so there's probably three. There's probably three reasons in, in that in that when variable. Okay, more time to manifest, more likely not to have MS mimics, and also the the younger you are, the more active you are likely. To yes, be. indeed, indeed. Okay. So and then they um, so then other variables they looked whether these variables influenced um, the so the the clinical manifestation in the future were gender. So in their previously previous cohort looking only at five year follow up, gender was an influencing factor. But now they were able um, yeah to to um, so to contradict this earlier finding. So gender didn't play a role anymore in your risk at uh, clinical manifestations later on. 
Family history, 10% of their patients had a family of uh, history of MS, which suggests that they had sufficient power to find um, an influence of family history, but it didn't make a difference. Ethnicity um, didn't make a difference, but it looks like they didn't have that many people of different ethnicity. And then, so, which is also um, what we have, what many other studies have shown is that um, oligoclonal bands in your cerebrospinal fluid, so the presence of oligoclonal bands, that this is significantly associated with clinical manifestations in the future. And this also survived the multivariate analysis. So it was an independent risk factor um, for, for clinical manifestation. Again, confirming that it's, I guess when we do a workup in these patients, it's important to be thorough and to, um, although they didn't have clinical manifestations, to subject them to um, all these technical examinations. Sorry, uh, it, um, mm -hmm. uh, quick question, Prof. Do you have any comments on the on the uh, uh, sex? Because uh, uh, you know, male sex is also a risk factor for aggressive MS. So. Well, I think I think male sex is um, a risk factor, is a risk factor for more disease progression. So this is at the stage where people are before, pre presumably before that. I'm not surprised that sex makes no difference because the sex ratio in terms of um, MS is okay. I agree, it's say two to one in terms of females to males in most countries, or higher than that. But I mean, if you're a male and you have lesions that are typical, there's no reason why I shouldn't predict uh, MS in males as well. I don't, I can't imagine males having more MS mimics or anything like that. So I, I think it's, I think it was just a false positive finding in the first, you know, in the first cohort that was described. And also, I think the median follow-up in the first paper from this group was about three point something years. It wasn't quite four years. So now we've got ten year follow-up, which is how much better. Yep. Yeah, yeah, but now it's also the mean. The mean clinical follow-up is like now seven point two years, eh? so it's still yeah. and median six point seven years. So I guess this is probably this kind of follow-up we're looking at to draw reliable conclusions. Yeah, I mean, oligoclonal bands is really important because the OCBs have always been predictive in people with uh, mm. even, uh, CIS to MS. Um, is also, so it's part. Yeah, I guess then, it's part of the disease. Yeah, but then I also have a question regarding this, because these patients fulfill the criteria for dissemination in space, and up to 65% of them had positive CSF, either oligoclonal bands or a positive uh, IgG index. So these patients are a mess, aren't they? Um, that's that's one of the that's one of the holes in the McDonald criteria. Is you know if you do, if you disseminate in time and space, you should have MS, but because you're not got any clinical events, you can't have MS. So this is actually a, a paper that's, I think, challenging the um, McDonald criteria, really asking us to have a category of asymptomatic MS. These people have got the disease. Mm, yeah. Well, how many, okay, I mean, let's cut to the chase. How many, yes. of, them had, how many of them had primary progressive MS? How many? 12%. Uh, yes. Yeah. Exactly, which is the kind of background ratio you see. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so what you were seeing is you're picking up people, uh, you know, the poor people who got primary progressive MS, you could pick them up much, much earlier than when they present. But, uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's finish the table. Really yeah, well. so the pr the variables so associated with uh, later on clinical manifestation are further the presence of infratentorial lesions, so spinal cord lesions and brainstem lesions, and then um, the presence of cervical or thoracic spinal cord lesions, so which more or less uh, is overlaying and then the and also then which is also interesting is that contrast enhancement is only um, significantly associated with the clinical manifestation at the in the univariate analysis but it's clearly less important um, than the on other factors because it doesn't survive in the multivariate analysis while this is like intuitively you would i at least uh, we think that contrast enhancement <laughs> It rings like this big alarm sign. It's really an alarm, like that there is active enhancements, but clearly um, it's less Im less important factor than um, the other factors that we've just named. So, um, and well, they I mean, also I think coming back to coming back to uh, gain enhancement. I mean, gain enhancement, as you know, you know, it's just a point in time. You know, it's it's you know, the average lesion only enhances three to four weeks. Yeah. So, you know, there's a good chance by the time these people. They have their scans randomly, I suppose, in terms yes. of where, and so you would imagine that you'll only pick up pick up a small portion of the enhancing lesions. 
So I'm, yes. not surprised, I'm not surprised at that result. No. So very interesting. They also looked, so they kind of um, combined all these risk factors um, and they um, then they looked, so here they do risk classification at baseline. So if you would want to tell something to um, the person that is in front of you in uh, in clinics, uh, then I think this small uh, part of the article is very interesting because it means that when you only have one risk factor, mm -hmm, that you have a 29% um, risk of converting to MS, uh, definite MS in the following 10 years. But then also um, when you have two risk factors, it's 54% and then 68% with three risk factors and then 87% with four risk factors. But yeah, so it means that especially in the patients in uh, with, with spinal cord or intraventorial lesions, I think you should be really, really be very, yeah, very, um, um, you should monitor them very closely um, to um, find clinical manifestations of, um, of, yeah, of potential MS. But this is like very, I think, very usable in clinical practice as a yeah. sort of guide wire. Yeah, I mean, one of the so one of the problems we have we had in clinical practice, which which is um, it depends where you live in and it depends what environment you're in. But a lot of people, for example, in the UK, will have what they would call critical illness insurance or insurance that covers their mortgage if they have bought a house or a property. Mm -hmm. And so, having a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis means you can um, uh, tr trigger that. Mm -hmm. Out, for example but the other thing is if you've got anything in your notes that suggests that you're at increased risk you may not be able to get one of these uh, mortgages or one of the or insurances yeah so putting a putting a label into somebody's notes that they've got radiologically isolated syndrome has consequences you know so um uh, but do um do uh, these um these um uh these firms have access to medical data Yes, because what happens is, is when you actually get yourself to insure yourself. So let's yeah. say you, let's say you were buying a property and you were getting a mortgage, and you, yeah. and, more, and you needed to have some insurance to cover uh, yeah. that mortgage. You have to give them a uh, fill in a questionnaire, and if you've got a, a, a diagnosis of radiologically isolated syndrome, you have to yeah. put in, put in the uh, disclosures. You've got to disclose yeah. it. I would imagine, based on this paper, yeah, yeah, yeah that this becomes a, a real, um, yeah, disease. Actually, hurdle. The actuaries, the actuaries would say, actually, we're going to treat you as having MS. We can't insure you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so this is this is kind of pushing uh, CIS into risk, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you, I think, you know, as a as a, you know, this is there's obviously the science behind this, and the uh, the. But it, but it also has ethical or obvious implications mm -hmm. in practice. So the question then is, um, I mean, we, uh, is the treatment of this disease? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can so that, yeah. So that is also what. So obviously they didn't really um, look into that um, in their in their paper. But what is interesting? So they all left this at the discretion of um, of the uh, clinicians involved. But I think approximately. Um, here, 16 percent yeah, of patients received of the people um, that were included in this trial were treated with sometimes very aggressive treatments, in my humble opinion. Uh, so, um, so yeah. it was like, in, yeah, you know, intuitively, you, especially people people with no clinical manifestations, you would go for the more platform uh, therapies like interferon beta um, and um, copaxone. Oops. But actually, some of these people were also treated with fingolimod and natalizumab. And so it's 16% of their uh, study cohort. And then they also did this statistical analysis to, to assess whether um, this, this was one of these variables that influenced clinical manifestation later on. And they couldn't find uh, a connection between early, early on DMT treatment um, uh, and later, um, and clinical man clinical manifestations later on. So that's also what I comment on in the discussion. So this difficulty um, in 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 management and in guiding these uh, these people further, because um, so in their statistical analysis there is no connection. But obviously, it has now become clear from many prospective studies, especially in Scandinavia, who, who have this great, great prospective data databases of people with MS. Um, so that many of these people actually 
before diagnosis, they manifest with cognitive symptoms, which are much more difficult to diagnose and to objectify. And so, and are um, yeah, undeniably a result of these um, t of these yeah of these T two white matter lesions. So that is a difficulty. Like on one hand, they report that DMTs or early on DMT doesn't doesn't influence the clinical manifestations. But on the other hand, we have this yeah. Tr this um, huge amount of evidence now that they discuss in this part of the uh, of the article that clearly shows that people have already 20 years before symptom onset have cognitive manifestations of disease that impact on their um yeah on quality their life, yeah. yeah quality of life and 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 also like uh future uh possibilities in terms of yeah, education or maybe kind of demanding jobs like we're multitasking or that kind of um, so, so, so the question is why the question is why don't the why doesn't the neurology committee community allow us to classify cognitive impairment as a, yeah. as, a as an involvement of a functional system yes that's true that it's but it is of course it's included now in the EDSS um, but it's quite actually you know it's one of these things that is it's the presence in the EDSS is so limited, uh, but actually it's so big for people with MS in reality. So, so the question I'm going to ask Saul, so you're now a practicing neurologist in Bogota. If you were referred a patient with uh, would it change your management? Prof, I didn't hear the very last part of your question. So if you had a if you had a patient with radiologically isolated syndrome, yeah, uh, and you didn't find any focal signs, and they hadn't given you a history of any symptoms, would you send them for detailed neuropsychological testing? Yes, I, I, I will. I think, I think, I mean, after after uh, reading this article and after reviewing all the available evidence, I, I think I will, I, I, I will test these patients with uh, imaging. I will do a uh, full CNS imaging study. I will do also examination of CSF. Uh, um, and uh, based on that, I will feel tempted in offering a treatment. But personally, I also find it very difficult because um, I think one of the things that is not discussed in this article, and it's more like uh, philosophical, obviously, but you, I, I think it's very difficult for people with um, that manifest with risk to stay motivated for a treatment because they have never had anything actually. So they never had any disease manifestation. So I personally, it's already very difficult sometimes to motivate people that that had like uh, visual disturbances or they had like temporarily they had like um, a paralysis of both legs. Some of times, even these people are not interested, are too afraid starting treatment. So imagine that we that you have people in front of you that only have a radiological manifestation. I think, and then you are then you are exposed to interferon beta, which has a lot of side effects. It's a total, it's a real hurdle, yeah, or it's a real hassle yeah. to get these injections. So the problem is that's also the thing. You have people that have or have no manif clinical manifestation, so it clearly affects the motivation to for the or the tolerance for side effects. And then you're probably more likely to offer them like platform therapies, which are equal side effects. Yeah. So the biggest problem we would find, um, not only in the United Kingdom and NHS, but in most healthcare systems, mm -hmm. that the reimbursement of treatments when you don't have a, a MS would be difficult. Yeah. 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 So, so what, what, I, what I was getting, what I was getting at when I was asking Saul that question, is what can you do to make the neurological examination more sensitive to document involvement of the pathway? So that was now exactly that what I was about to say. I mean, Ede is totally is totally right. As everything in MS decisions should be shared with the patient, but then maybe we can use all this evidence on the cognitive impairment. Uh, on the impact on quality of life and also their prodromal symptoms you can actually have uh, in patients with a risk that are quite disabling like fatigue and sort of try and, and objectively measure this disability to make the case and offer treatment to these patients, right? But th this is indeed true and it's just, it's not only for risk but it's for everyone. Every 
people, every person with MS, it shouldn't only be about motor or sensory symptoms. It should be yeah, about all these other cognitive domains too. Yeah, so what, what, Prof, what would you do if you if you don't have any any restrictions under well, the NHS for risk patients? What would you do? Well, the point about it is, is is what you've decided to do is you, you interrogate these patients to try and find symptoms. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you want to find symptoms, you can interrogate them to find, and this is what we would call a neurological stress test. You would send them for cognitive testing. You may send them on a out for a run or exercise, bring them back and re-examine them to try and pick up focal symptoms. And then you could actually make the patient aware that they've got deficits in particular pathways. And I think by showing them they've got deficits in pathways and explaining to them what MS is and how it manifests and that they are highly likely in the future to become symptomatic because they've got all these risk factors. Um, and the idea is to treat early to prevent damage. You may be able to um, uh, convince these patients that they have got MS, um, mm -hmm at least biological MS, and that treatment early is in their best interest. Uh, or the other option is you just put them under um, you know, more intensive follow-up. So you bring them back. Yeah. I mean, David, David Miller, uh, before he retired, always used to bring back risk patients uh, for repeat scanning. And he used to do them quite early. He used to do like three and six and then 12 months and then every year after that. So you don't, so you don't let them um, run away from you with activity. But again, you had to have... A clinical event to be able to offer them treatment. Uh, yes, yeah. and and both. Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on the on the use of neurofilaments to predict conversions of these patients? Because there are some there is some evidence on this as well. Yeah, yeah I also find it very interesting. It's one something they also raised in their discussion that maybe at disease onset, so at when you diagnose this uh, risk that you could also include uh, neurof neurofilaments as an additional marker for disease activity. Now, I mean, the other thing you also include is central vein size. So you yeah. do a yeah. susceptibility weighted imaging and see if you can pick up a central vein. Yeah. Now, the problem about the central vein sign is nobody knows how to define it. <laughs> That's true. So some people would say, which is the NIH, Danny Reich group, would say you can just do three lesions and show two of, if you've got two of three lesions about a central vein, it's positive. Mm -hmm. Other people want you to um, count more than uh, three lesions and see in, in three quarters after they have the central vein sign. So until we've actually operationalized and validated that and got a definitive measurement, it's, it's uh, difficult to know how to incorporate the central vein sign into into these algorithms. But it, I, mean, I think in the future it will get there. It's just a matter of the studies being done and being and uh, and measured. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who joined, they, uh, we're talking about the latest uh, uh, paper, the biggest uh, uh, longitudinal study on, on risk patients um, and looking at what predicts conversion to uh, MS. Um, there is two clinical. There are two clinical trials going on at the moment. Yes. Yeah, the Arise and the Terry study. Yes, here. So one of them is one of them looking at DMF. The other one, Terry Frenemar. They're identical studies. One happening in Europe, one in America. And um, they're not sponsored by companies. They're sponsored by academic institutions. But based on the biology of MS, these trials, if they're powered properly, should be positive. In other words, Terry Frenemar and DMF should stop or at least um, delay yeah. the onset of the first clinical event. But the only reason why they wouldn't be positive is because of lack of power, no? That's the mm. only reason. Okay. Because it's very, I think very, it's very clear from this paper and from so much other uh, scientific evidence that risk is on the spectrum of MS. And as it has already been shown in cis and in other like um, disease subtypes, treatments influence, obviously, clinical manifestation. So I see Ben, Ben joined us, Ben. Hi, Ben. You want to unmute? Hi, guys. Hey, Hello. Hello. So, Ask your question. This is Cam. This is Cam. So Cameron is working with Charlie. Oh, nice Hi. to meet you. Yeah, lovely to meet you all. <laughs> so, so Ben, what do, what do you think the implications for the MS field are if there's a positive risk trial? Well, it's huge, isn't it? If we can, if we can predict, we can prevent. I mean, this, this is the closest we can get to prevention at the moment, right? It's treating treating risk and preventing clinical disability. So it would be absolutely exceptional 
I, I agree with you, Ida. I think there's no reason to think this is a different disease, right? It behaves in the same way, and these longitudinal studies all seem to suggest the same thing, that these people do evolve into clinically definite MS. So, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely huge. I mean, the question is, can we risk stratify with slightly more refined clinical and genetic variables? So I don't, I don't think these guys are doing genetics on this lot, but that would be very important. No, but I would expect the genetics are exactly the same as for, for MS in general, for relapse and remitting MS. No, that's also one of the things that has, be, that has come clear out of all these gen genome-wide association studies that progressive MS and relapsing MS have exactly the same genetic risk variants. And similarly, Do we know if they have genotypes on these guys. I, I think so, a lot of these people go. A lot of the people included in this uh, study go long way back. They have been including from 1999, uh, 1990. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. you know, this is <laughs> this is a long. This is the time where we still into Sanger sequencing. So <laughs> I don't think they uh, had like a big um, that they at that time made big efforts to also it's include the uh, DNA. But what I would imagine the group is probably biobanking these specimens and will be planning to do genetic studies. But I, I think what I think I think a positive risk trial, though, be it the teriflinamide or the dimethyl, will challenge the current diagnostic criteria. And you know, it'll mean that the next time a uh, review of the diagnostic criteria are done, they're going to have to think about how they incorporate um, a category called radiologically isolated syndrome. Now the danger there is you're going to start incorporating MS mimics because you you know as soon as you shift this diagnosis earlier and earlier you may bring in MS mimics. Yeah, yeah but that's the, that's the story of all re, all older revisions of all criteria. No, every time they kind of faci facilitate it to diagnose MS, so every time it becomes more critical as a neurologist to have your yeah <laughs> to to be very yeah to be very cautious in diagnosing. In people because criteria make it more easy but in reality obviously um, you need to be very critical about um, yeah who you label as with these kind of syndromes and who you don't okay um, so, so um, now the other the other question you know, is if somebody was a thinking individual uh, and they had risks with a pretty high lesion load and maybe some early brain volume loss or and they wanted to have HACT. Um, so, you know, would you support that decision to be treated aggressively with the most aggressive therapy? Which, which? Uh... Yeah, I. A really that's a very question. that's a very difficult question. So, I think um, um, I think it would depend on um, first of all the story and the 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 person itself, because if this is like a 50 year old people person with risk versus a 20 year old like all these things would um, influence my judgment um, but so in a world where um, no um, administrative boundaries would be had to advise all these therapies i i think if you have like the full picture you have your csf you have your cognitive testing you have maybe um, dissemination in space without clinical manifestation I would be very worried about this patient, about this person in the long run. So, theoretically, I think I would I would understand that somebody would want to take the risk. But I think, yeah, but it's very very difficult because I, the risk, you know, especially because the risks with uh, stem cell therapy, you have your infertility, uh, you have like also a big influence on on cognition. It's also mortal. Um, so, um, I. I think if only 50% in 10 years time would manif clinically manifest, it's, it's very difficult to justify this, um, I think, for me as a person to, um, to recommend this to patients. So no, I, must say I, I, will be, I, I will say it will be very unlikely for a patient to uh, <laughs> high vision load or a very severe form of risk to not have symptoms, right? Uh, but again, it's all about individualized decisions and, and you know, yeah. taking into account risk and benefits. Uh, yeah. yeah. I've got a handful of patients who are familial MS. In other words, they've had uh, cousins, brothers, sisters, uh, um, uh, mothers who've had a very bad MS and uh, ended up dying. And then they, um, uh, these people are the ones that want to push for the most aggressive therapies up front, simply because they don't want to see what happened to their family member to them. 
So if you told one of these particular individuals who understands and has been exposed to how bad MS can be, um, yeah. I've had a few examples in my own clinical practice of these people going abroad for HSCT regardless of what you tell them, uh, simply because they don't want to um, uh, be exposed to the ravages of MS. So based on our principles of treat early, treat aggressively, um, there's nothing earlier than, than risk in in, in, in yeah, that's right. So you have to actually tell that patient they shouldn't do it. It's very hard. And so I think you'd have to support them through that decision. Yeah. If they wanted to go and pay for it themselves and do it, you'd have to support them. But you wouldn't. Um, I don't think we're in a position to say you shouldn't do it because at the end of the day, the risks are the individual. So this is this is this is kind of the Pandora's box we're opening up. Yeah, we can worm opening up by moving the diagnosis earlier and earlier. But that's where we want to be. You know, the, the fact that HACT is dangerous, we may end up with a, a therapeutic option that gives you similar results. It may not be as risky. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you could argue maybe another another immune reconstitution therapy. I say adamtuzumab is, is probably in the same bracket. Cladribine may not be. I mean, you, you've seen the CIS uh, trial of cladribine. Mm -hmm. uh, we were hoping to see if that persists in terms of its efficacy, but, you know, it may be a safer option. So this is an exciting time, you know, um, uh, maybe we will get to population screening. You know, this is something that uh, Ben's smiling there. Population screening, we can pick up more CIS patients. But I think the important message of this cohort is a similar proportion of them will go on to develop primary progressive MS. Yeah. And that's, that to me is the biggest argument for treating these patients if they've got active uh, risks. Because uh, as as you know, 10 to 15 percent will come back with primary progressive disease in a few years' time. And by the time they come back with primary progressive disease, they've lost a lot of their reserve. They've lost a lot of nerve fibers, and hopefully, by treating them earlier, you can you can prevent that or at least delay it. Are you guys surprised by how many of the people with uh, bland CSF convert to MS? Seems quite a high proportion. It is a high proportion, but I think a lot of these. Uh, CSFs were done been in, in an era where they were using not the gold standard for oligoclonal band detection. Uh, mm. fine. So you know the Elena, uh, the uh, isoelectric focusing with immunofixation, was only FDA approved quite recently. So a lot of labs in the United States were using uh, inferior technology for many years. They were using uh, agarose acrylamide gel with silver staining, and they weren't using immunofixation. So no, using those t techniques, you missed about 30% of the bands come back negative from the laboratories is that the, the technology hadn't caught up there. But, um, but, I, but I think there's also this issue um, that hasn't been resolved. Even when you use it, and this is something I, I don't know how to explain, even when you use the best technology with immunofixation, the proportion of patients with negative CSF goes up. The um, more MS mimics uh, creep in. But uh, if you look at the Italian and Spanish cohorts where they do use very good uh, CSF analysis, and the number of people with negative CSFs goes up. And I can't explain it. I really can't explain it. Um, okay, any other comments people want to make? Mohammed, I see Mohammed's on. Hi, Mohammed, how are you? Welcome. Um, how are you? Do you want to introduce yourself to everybody, Mohammed? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Uh, well, I'm a new face. I'm a new face here. I'm uh, Mohammed, Mohammed Abdul Wafa. Uh, my short name, maybe Wafa. Wafa is, uh, is a more famous name for me, for my friends. Um, I'm, I'm a clinical research fellow, a brand new clinical research fellow, thanks to uh, the Professor Gavin and Dr. Chan Lee. Um, actually, I um, I work with uh, I used to work with multiple sclerosis for like the previous four years of my career. Um, I used to uh, work with neuroimaging uh, mostly, most of the time for the last four years, uh, specifically with. Um, uh, volumetric measurements like a brain atrophy and spinal cord atrophy and so. Um, but uh, with a very uh, generous discussion with Professor Gavin, like uh, like six months ago in Cairo, uh, I suggested that I may come to uh, Queen Mary and become one of the team members here. So, uh, and lastly, uh, after a long journey with Charmini and the uh, uh, administrative issues, I'm here for like uh, one week now. 
<laughs> okay, so Mohammed, welcome. So what do you what do you, what do you want us to call you? What's your what's your what would you like to be referred to then? Wafa? Okay, well, well, maybe Wafa. Yeah, Wafa is great. It's, uh, it's my father's name, and I like it, so it's, uh, it's good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Wafa, welcome. So tell me, in in Egypt, in Cairo, yes. when, you, when you're doing lumbar punctures on all the MS patients, yes. what's the proportion that are CSF negative? I'm talking about oligoclonal IgG band negative. Is it high? Yes, this is one, no, uh, uh, unexpectedly low. It's not exceeding 64% at yeah. the uh, most uh, positive uh, out uh, from our registries, which is quite interesting, uh, unusual. Uh, I think it, uh, uh, this was a, a, a good area for, investiga for investigation, at least for myself and the uh, uh, previous couple of years, uh, because mm -hmm. uh, the African population or the uh, North African population at least, uh, has a low prevalence of uh, oligoclonal bands. Uh, a number of um, uh, features is different from one geographical place to another. Uh, but at least this is replicated also in, um, North, Amer in uh, North America, the African uh, origin, also the Caribbean, African uh, Car Caribbean uh, black population has a low prevalence for all the coronal bandages. It's unexplained, and um, I don't know if it, if it is related to um, the more relative, more aggressive disease course in these populations, because we, we, we have a very, um, uh, shorter duration to EFS uh, 6 compared to uh, European or North American white population. Yeah, so this, uh, so do, do you know what laboratory technique is used in, in, in Egypt? Are you using the best, the most modern technique, the eyes electric focusing? There, there may be a technical issue, but not because of uh, the technique itself, because we, we do ship our own uh, samples to Europe. We, we don't do the, uh, the examination ourselves. So there might be an issue with with uh, with transporting the sample. No, I don't think so. The, the antibodies are really robust, but it would be unlikely a transport issue. But 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 this is also replicated in, in other cohorts, like in um, in France. Uh, there there are many uh, population from Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia because um, of migration. These people with MS there have a low prevalence of oligoclonal bands as well. But this has probably also to do with a different genetic um, background, no? Because um, the the most important risk factor for MS in European MS or is the HLA-DR15, while for example in in African MS, it's the um, this is not the most the most important risk factor is the I think it's HLA-DR13, but it doesn't matter which specific one. Yeah, yeah, so it's not okay. the same. So I think probably this kind of so as this is one of the most important receptors in yeah uh, in antigen presentation, it might also have an influence on oligoclonal bands, and maybe that's also why we see lower levels of oligoclonal band positivity in African or um, yeah. MS yeah. compared to yeah but Caucasian. I really think uh, both both effect, both effects because, for example, like, like the second generation of of people with who have uh, immigrated to Europe or North America, the second generation mimics the typical pattern of, of uh, multiple sclerosis regarding the oligoclonal band's positivity and the aggressiveness or relatively a more benign course compared to the first generation. So I think there is an interplay between both genetics and, and uh, environment. Mm -hmm. But, but, but Wafa, in the studies that have been done in the European populations, oligoclonal bands predict the worst course. So those that are OCB negative in European populations do better. And that's not only in the relapsing, but also in the primary progressive group. I've got data that came out of the TIVA trial. Been, I, need, I need somebody to write it up for me. Is anyone willing to write a paper? Uh, um, uh, yes, it would be great. If so, but uh, yes, but uh, there are uh, there's a total impressions. It needs to be translated into uh, objective findings. This would be great. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, uh, either I think we're winding down here. Mm -hmm. but, um, there's some really important implications of uh, this paper and what it means for clinical practice. So we, we probably um, uh, need to watch this space. I think we really do need a strategy for shifting the diagnostic criteria to include radiologically isolated syndromes, possibly with some more robust biomarkers to make sure we're not including uh, possible MS. Mm -hmm.
mm -hmm. central vein sign, maybe neurofilament levels, uh, other things. Uh, mm -hmm. We clearly should be thinking about how we treat these patients and also developing uh, te technologies or using technologies to stress the nervous system that we pick up subclinical involvement, be it cognition or parameters yes. or using evoked potentials to show involvement of various pathways. You know, I, I personally think once you can get objective evidence that a pathway is involved, um, whether or not somebody has symptoms is probably not that important because we're talking about people that may go up with a primary progressive disease. And you probably could make a case um, that these people have MS and offer them a treatment. Um, yeah, it, it requires a sort of mind, mind uh, a mental shift towards preventive treatment um versus mm. yeah versus <laughs> treatment when <laughs> the damage has already occurred so yeah, so i was at a meeting in spain about two years ago where i was teaching a trainee uh, uh, trainee registrars and um, one of the questions i asked them if you had uh, radiologically isolated syndrome and it was active in other words we rescanned you and there were new lesions or there was enhancing lesions would you want to be treated or not treated what do you think the uh, Rough estimate, how many people do you think put their hands up about have been on a treatment? 100%. It was all, uh, there was about two people who didn't, but there was about 27 people, and I think 25 out of 27 put up their hands and I want to be on a treatment. So the question then, and these are trainees, okay? So um, one of the things, one of the litmus tests is if, you know, uh, it, these trainees were convinced this is MS, but they were convinced the disease was causing damage and they were convinced that DMTs change in natural history of multiple sclerosis, therefore they wanted to be on a treatment. What I didn't ask them is if they would have HACT or alentuzumab, or, <laughs> because, you know, I think uh, the same principles um, in terms of preserving the brain in risk will apply to, what, what happens in MS will apply to risk, the more effective the treatment, the better the outcome. And so this is where the risk-benefit balance is really difficult. Yeah. Anybody want to have any final comments? Um, uh, Cameron, I want you to tell Ben because he's on the on the phone over there. So I, want to, I want you to think very carefully about how we test the hypothesis that Ian has just put out that the <laughs> negative oligoclonal bands is due to genetics. Uh, I'll be very, yeah. you know, we, we probably need to have a cohort of patients from all over the world uh, and look at the genetics to see if there are any, particularly uh, MHC or immune response genes that predicts a negative oligoclonal band response in people that fulfill the criteria for having MHC. Yeah. I, I think it could be, could be right. We, we, have, we have a study here in Colombia performing 1985 or something. Uh, of course, it wasn't using it uh, as isoelectro, um, uh, as electric focusing technique. And the prevalence was about 30%. Uh, we don't have any 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 um, um, recent study using the isoelectric focusing technique. So, but yeah, could be could be related to genetic differences. Yeah, definitely. So we should we, we should we should repeat this uh, study internationally with genetics. Yeah, it would be really interesting because you know this is having and uh, not having oligoclonal bands. It's one of the. It's a huge. It could be. Maybe we could, it would be even necessary to treat these, these people in a different way. It's a huge diagnostic and prognostic sign that um, not having bands would maybe also have, Ali, would also require us rethinking um, that subgroup of MS. Okay. All right. So, I mean, we're going to try and make these journal clubs more frequent now um, and regular, and we will do them online like this and record them as well and put them so people, other people can watch them. So, Ida, are you prepared to um, coordinate a little schedule of uh, journal clubs that w with people presenting? Uh, definitely, yes. So, normally, I don't know if you were aware, but uh, Stephanie already booked in one for next week. Okay, so who, who, uh, does anybody want to do an article for next week? Wafa, you got time to do an article for next week? Yeah, yeah, yeah I would be uh, uh, very motivated about it. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. So if we can, if you can actually send an article to Ida, she can then uh, uh, set up a set up a Google invite and uh, distribute the article, and then we can all log in next week. Okay, Ready perfect. For, is there any chance I could sneak onto the mailing list for that? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, so what, what I what I'm going to suggest, Ida, is you you expand the mailing list to include, <laughs> all, include all the registrars, all the trainees, mm -hmm. and also the 
the um, all the uh, all the people who are working in the uh, um, preventive neurology unit, okay, as well. Great. Uh, yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. I was just going to say, Gavin, if you've got any spare money, because um, we're going to <laughs> we're going to genotype all these people from various ethnic backgrounds, but we don't have the money to CSF biobank them. Oh, okay. um, in the future, it would be good to biobank them. So, yeah, so let's uh, yeah, the, yeah, at, at the moment, the, uh, there's a big there's a big problem with finance, as you know. So we'll, to, let, let, let's put the down let's put down the international the international um, study on csf oligoclonal band positivity versus negativity um, versus in europeans versus people from africa or africa caribbean descent or even south american and see if we can answer the question it's a really important question then because we think that the oligoclonal bands are pathogenic but they may just be irrelevant yeah so this may be completely so this particular observation may mean they're completely irrelevant to ms pathogenesis um, uh, why why do you think they're pathogenic? Why do I think so? I'll tell you why, because when you take the oligoclonal bands out from the CSF and you put them into cell culture systems, they are neurotoxic, both to oligodendrous, mm -hmm. glial toxic and neurotoxic. Um, a lot of these subtle lesions that occur and the slowly expanding lesions mm -hmm. look like they may be due to uh, uh, macrophage activation by a, a gamma FC receptor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of studies have shown complement activation in immunoglobulin deposition in the in, in, in MS lesions. Those immunoglobulins must be responding to something. So there's lots of circumstantial evidence. Anti-CD20 therapies work. Um, but, but, you know, so it's an hypothesis. You know, they're in vivo evidence. If you give it to mice, I'm not boned up on this. If you give it to mice, so they get EAE. But are you kind of bands? No. Yeah, if you just give human CSF, no. What, what, you, what you can do, though, is if you get anti-neurofilament antibodies, which a significant number of oligoclonal bands are reacted against neurofilaments, yeah. a, that does uh, cause a phenotype in mice, which is done by uh, Sandra A. Moore, uh, like, a, like a rapidly, it actually uh, um, speeds up progression. David, are you still online? All right. The mouse doctor's online. David, tell people what happens when you give anti-neurofilament antibodies to EAE. I get a really progressive course. Mm. So, 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 so it does modify EAE, but it doesn't cause EAE. So I do it. So Mohammed, I'm watching, this is a good project for you, Wafa, is to do a, re a review of the literature and pull out yeah. all the articles on why oligoclonal bands in MS are pathogenic. Okay. 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 So, okay. That's good. Good. It's a good review because because one of the projects you're doing is relating to the Takeda grant. It is we try to get rid of these audio kind of bands, you see. So it's really relevant. Very well. Okay, guys, I've got another meeting to go to, so take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.